Oxytocin, the love hormone, overruns and overrides cortisol, the fear hormone. So here we see the operationalizing of the scripture, perfect love, oxytocin, casts out fear, cortisol. And so I would say any scripture that reminds you of how loved you are, that God is love, is really key to helping us heal, reduce anxiety, reduce depression, OCD, all of those behaviors. Love is very key in that. Welcome to Dreamers and Disciples. I'm so excited about today's episode. We have Joe Hargreaves on the show today, and Joe is a psychotherapist, writer, and speaker who, along with her husband, also pastors a church in the UK. And she specializes in teaching how to renew your mind through scripture and neuroscience. So we have a fascinating and extremely helpful conversation around how to actually take your thoughts captive tools to overcome anxiety, and then what practices like gratitude and meditation on scripture do to your brain, and finally, how to process pain and tragedy around the world as a follower of Jesus. So I put together a list of scripture to help go along with today's episode, because I wanted to give you some scriptures to help you overcome anxiety and fear as you memorize and meditate on them. So you can find these scriptures in the show notes. This list is absolutely free. And this will help you in the pivot practices also that I talk about in my new book, This Dream Is Not For You. So we mentioned that on the show today, and I think those scriptures will help you put into practice a lot of what we talked to Joe about. So let's join in that conversation right now. Joe, welcome to the podcast. It's great to have you here. Thank you for having me. It's really nice to see you, Wade. It's nice to see you too. Um, I start every uh, episode with this question, what are you dreaming about right now? So I'd love to hear your answer. Yeah, I knew you were going to ask me that because I've heard that that's how you start your episodes. Um, Well, two things. One is just a very human practical thing of, I just feel in a busy season right now, you know, those seasons where, those times where one out of three kids is sick on repeat. And so, (laughs) you know, sleepless nights, all that kind of stuff, busy schedules. And so I'm dreaming of a really good night's sleep without being woken up. Uh, yes, so that, that is real. Is very, <laughs> yes, totally. That's the real, that's the reality of where I'm at. You know, that's actually my very human dream right now. But then if I was about to, if I was going to think of it from like a zoom out a little bit and have a wider and almost prophetic perspective, what I always dream of is people's wholeness and wellness and people feeling well in the body, soul and spirit against some of the narrative that we're seeing um, around people's issues around and the struggles, you know, that people are having generally um, with kind of just what it is to live in this general 21st century life, but also specifically, you know, as, as things unfold in the news and in our own lives of how do we as followers of Christ um, find wholeness and wellness in every area of our existence. Yeah, I, I love that. I was telling you before we hit record that I'm fascinated and so encouraged by the content that you put out on social media. And and you and I have had a conversation before on a different podcast, but I just love your insight and how you bring neuroscience as, uh, is it psychotherapist? Is that the right way to describe what you do? Yeah, it is. So I don't know if there's a difference between a UK psychotherapist and a US one. <laughs> I know that... Um, uh, yeah, so in the UK, I, I am called a psychotherapist. You have to get to a martyr's level. You have to be accredited. That's how we, um, but I, I don't want to get you in trouble by saying I am one. And then <laughs> maybe that doesn't translate into the US. But yes, that's what I would call myself here in the UK. Yeah. Well, I, I love what you talk about in, in, in marrying the science of neuroscience with what scripture teaches. And everything is is leading towards how can we find that sense of wholeness that we were created for in Christ. So can you talk about that journey for you? What led you to want to study this? What led you to want to help people find wholeness? I'd love to hear that backstory. Yeah, okay. Well, I I think for me it was about, um, it's, it's always been about loving people and always being interested in people's wholeness. And teaching that in terms of being a pastor of a church for 10 years me and my husband lead a church together and um 
and that being very much part of our work within the church of using God's word and um, leaning into scripture and um, believing what God says about who we are and whose we are and how that can impact us at a holistic body level. But also I, um, as I train, I trained as a counsellor a long time ago and then have been upskilling myself over the last five years. And as those kind of two tracks have run along together, I've seen how much they intersect, that a lot of what is being taught in the field of neuroscience or um, psychotherapy, even pop psychology, really intersects with scripture. And a lot of what is called modern breakthroughs in neuroscience. So I'll give you one, for example, a modern breakthrough of the fact that we've realized now that the brain isn't fixed, that it's neuroplastic is a scientific term, that we can mold it, that we can shape it. And the primarily way we do prim the primary way we do this is through our thoughts. So this was big news in the field of neuroscience. And I'm thinking, oh, hold on a minute. That's <laughs> Romans 12, 2. Or be transformed by yeah. the renewing of your mind. It's, the, it's what informs cognitive behavioral therapy. We have to change the way we think before we change the way we live. And so as I understand that as a therapeutic process and principle, I see that actually from Genesis to Revelation, all the way through scripture, we see God saying, be careful how you think, be careful how you manage your mind, your thoughts run your life, you know, as a man thinketh, so he is. And I just have began to see that again and again of how these two things intersect. And I've just become increasingly passionate about it. So when you talk about our thought life and the impact it has on the rest of our well-being, you know, um, we talk a lot in church about taking your thoughts captive. I find that that's something that is easy to like get excited about when you hear it in a sermon or when you read that scripture. But for me, it can be a hard thing to put into practice sometimes because I tend to be more of an anxious personality. I can, I can skew towards worry. And so it's been a lifelong journey of, of trying to find disciplines to help me do that. What are you finding in your study and your research and in your working with other people? What are some practical ways to help us actually do that and live out that scripture? Yeah, I, I really hear you on that. And I, I that's been my journey too. Particularly for me, it's been around health anxiety um, and worry about that kind of thing and going down the route of Googling symptoms, <laughs> you know, all that kind yep. of thing. And um, actually, interestingly, I was speaking to somebody about this the other day and saying, I was joking because I was saying, when I was a teenager, we didn't have Google. We had um, Reader's Digest Family Medical or like, you know, a big yep. array encyclopedia. And um, it would list all the symptoms and things of um, certain diseases. And I'd look through them and kind of diagnose myself with all these things. And I realized that I do have a predisposition for whatever reason. I do have a predisposition towards thinking, anxious thoughts. And I think, like you said, some of us are more predisposed. But what I'm learning, and this again is where scripture and science intersect, is that our predisposition does not have to be our predestination. We don't have mm -hmm. to live out what we're predestined one because you know the grace of god is knitted into our very dna so neurobiologically by taking our thoughts captive and i'll unpack that a bit in a minute of what that actually looks like um so neurobiologically our brain is capable of doing that but also scripture again is always inviting us to a higher narrative like a better story the god story in our lives so therefore the predestination um, predisposition doesn't need to be the predestination which is just a good thing to know in and of itself. You might be wired towards anxiety, depression, even addiction, because we see that can be passed down, you know, epigenetically from generation to generation. Um, but yes, you're right. How do you actually put legs on that scripture? And I think often we think we have to be very over spiritual about stuff and come up and it, and it be a very spiritual, deep, profound practice. But for me, it's been very as simple as when I am catastrophizing, which is something I tend to do, I'm driving to work, I'm catastrophizing, I'm making myself fearful, I bring to mind that scripture. And rather than go through a huge deep process, I just notice that I'm doing this thing, I name it, and then I begin to reframe it, which is something that I, I would use to unpack that scripture and put legs on it. Notice that you're doing it, name what you're doing and begin to reframe it. I love that because you can't heal something 
that's hidden or that's in the dark. You have to bring it to light and actually bring it to God, bring it to your own awareness to know what needs to to be fixed about it, what needs to be healed, what needs to be surrendered. I even talk in my book about pivot practices of pivoting daily from striving to surrender. And somebody was telling me recently, they're like, oh, when am I ever gonna get over these like intense feelings of trying to make things happen and to strive to earn approval? And I told them, I was like, I I don't know if this is what you wanna hear, but I don't know if you ever get over that. I think what we do as we mature in Christ is that we learn to name it quickly. We learn to identify what our triggers are and we more quickly bring it to God and bring it into the light. And so I, I, what you just said resonates with me so much. I think it's becoming more and more self-aware so that we can more quickly bring it to Jesus and let his word uh, frame it or reframe it, as you said. Do you have like, so what are some of those scriptures that help you in your times of anxiety? So key ones for me are around feeling safe. Um, so God is a refuge, a strong tower, um, that he's close to the brokenhearted and those who feel crushed in spirit, that he's a nurturer, a gatherer, that he gathers his chicks. And I, for me, and I think for humanity in general, if I was so bold as to make such a sweeping statement, is that for us to feel grounded, for us to feel um Or for us to go on a journey of healing and feeling healthy and whole in body, soul and spirit, as God promises in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, is the importance of feeling safe and loved. Hmm. And I think often um, we want to rush to like the John 10.10 stuff of like, I want to live life and life in all its fullness. You know, that's my right as as a follower of Christ. And that's right. That's true. Jesus does say that. But in order to live the breadth of John 10 10 we really need to understand the depth of John 3 16 that is that God Hmm. so loved the world that we're so loved so incredibly loved and also we're so incredibly safe in terms of I mean I don't know about you I'm prone to the odd existential crisis I just (laughs) go there naturally in my head and it's nice to know you know in terms of our very existence in terms of our eternity we are safe And just that deep truth and deep knowing and understanding that we're safe and we're loved is key, I think. So for me, any scriptures that help me feel safe and loved, then there's the other one, which again is just this gorgeous intersection of therapy and theology, is the one John, perfect love casts out fear. But when we're feeling fearful, um, we're kind of in the survival part of our brain. Our body's too busy surviving to try and even get into the thriving part. It's all trying to keep it. It's all about survival and trying to keep us safe. But what's so interesting is that when we're full of fear, we get filled with cortisol and adrenaline, all the stress hormones. But the very thing that counteracts the cortisol is oxytocin, which is the love hormone. So we hmm. get the love hormone When we feel in love, it's also when we have a baby and everyone else thinks they look quite peculiar. We're like, oh, they're so beautiful because they're so (laughs) filled with oxytocin. Um, Also, we get it from chocolate, which isn't lost on me at all. Um, So oxytocin, the love hormone, overruns and overrides cortisol, the fear hormone. So here we see the operationalizing of the scripture, perfect love, oxytocin, casts out fear, cortisol. And Hmm. so I would say any scripture that reminds you of how loved you are, that God is love, is really key to helping us heal, reduce anxiety, reduce depression, OCD, all of those behaviors. Love is very key in that. That's so fascinating and beautiful how the more we learn about our own genetic wiring, our makeup, the way our body functions, it all lines up with the scripture, with how God designed us how he wired us to function. So next time I'm fearful, I'm going to focus on love and eat chocolate is basically what I hear you saying. You know, if I could prescribe you anything, it would be that. And I think often you do, you you hear people um, say, yeah, don't give in to your feelings, don't give in to fear. And I'm like, but how? Like, what does that mean? So I think rather than going to war with fear, we turn our back on it and we look to love. And not only does that become this beautiful spiritual um, principle that's deeply scriptural, but it it manifests in our physical bodies too. Yeah. One of the things that 
I've taught, and I want you to tell me if this is right or not <laughs> from a scientific <laughs> perspective, is that we've been taught a lot of times in church to deny our emotions, to, to deny the negative emotions. I used to think that I had to feel perfect faith all the time. And what I have seen in my own life is that it's when I actually give myself the space to feel the emotions and to see what they are trying to tell me that it actually draws me closer to God. So even my negative emotions, if channeled correctly and brought to Jesus, they're an indicator of something. So I would say that emotions are not good decision makers, but they're great indicators. Oh, I love is, that. Cool. is there truth to that? Like, what do we do with the emotions inside of us that I feel like they continue to raise their head time and time and time again, and we just can't get past the anger. We just can't feel like we can get past the fear or the whatever it is. We all have our, our different tendencies. How would you counsel somebody in that situation? They feel defeated by their emotions. Yeah. Oh, gosh. I, I, I so get that. And I see that. I see it in my own life. I see it in the life of the people that I pastor, that I work with in the therapy room. And I think the, the analogy I would use is that if we kept having a repetitive wound on our arm, say, for example, that kept being a wound, it kept weeping, it kept coming up again and again, and we just kept putting a plaster on it and saying, it's okay, it's okay, just ignore it, ignore it, ignore it, where that doesn't help us heal. It One just covers it up temporarily, but it just keeps coming back again and again because the wound is just a signpost. It's a sign of something deeper that's going on. It's, um, it's like you said, it's an indicator. It indicates what's going on in our lives. And I think um, it's a very interesting kind of church culture that we've got into where we kind of shout at people in this very evangelical way don't feel your feelings and I think I just don't see that scripturally mm. I don't I don't see it with Jesus who got angry who was so consumed with feelings in the garden of Gethsemane that he he was so dysregulated so out of his window of tolerance that he sweated blood mm. um so I would say denying your feelings is a recipe for disaster that it might sound quite holy um, but I don't think it's biblical and it's it's I don't think it's theological and it's th certainly not therapeutically sound because um, it, it does us no good. Our feelings are signposts. They're, they're telling us something. And how beautiful that when we feel those things, we don't need to feel them in isolation. We can go to God. We don't have to censor ourselves or edit ourselves before him. We can go to him. And as we go to him, what happens neurobiologically, we feel safe, we feel loved, we move out of threat system into kind of prefrontal cortex, feeling grounded. And it's only really from this front brain space that we can um, do the healthy, holy, holy work of, of healing and finding wholeness. I think when we deny stuff or we feel like there's a it's it's wrong of us or bad of us and we're unholy of us to feel our feelings we get stuck in survival mode and we don't heal from there so theologically i can't align myself with it therapeutically it doesn't play out yeah i mean I, th I think you're spot on because i think there's also a balance of we've got to feel it and be able to sit in the feeling while not being controlled by the feeling and i think that's a you know, that that's something that we have to to learn how to do. One thing that's helped me when you were talking about naming your fear or naming your anxiety, is there anything from a neurobiological standpoint from the way our brain functions? I found that sometimes naming it allows me to get a bit of distance from it too. And so I can start to separate myself from the feeling. Yes, I feel this, but I'm not this. And so... Is there anything that happens when you, because I've even heard people say that from a counseling standpoint, you can always counsel somebody else in a similar situation to you better than you can navigate it yourself. So sometimes I've been told to counsel myself as if I'm a client and like write it down and almost create that separation. Is there anything in the brain that actually helps you get above it when you do that? Does that make sense? Or is that a confusing question? Yeah. 
No, it's a great question. And yes, we're born with the inherent, we're born with the ability to stand out of ourselves and witness ourselves. We, I think, I imagine um, that we're the only species who are able to do that. I think I'm quite sure of that as a fact, <laughs> that we can stand out. Um, and that's why we can take our thoughts captive. Um, because we're able to witness ourselves and notice the feeling, notice why it might, what might be going on, but then, yeah, name it, but not take, not <laughs> name it, but not claim it as an identity. And I, I say this to my children, I say it to my clients, I say it to myself regularly. Um, when people say I'm, um, I've got, um, I'm anxious, I say you're not. You are experiencing anxiety. Or people say, I'm depressed. No, you are experienced depression, but that is not your identity. And I think there is some stuff, um, particularly secular society, that allows us to align our identity um, with the I am anxious, I am depressed, I am all these things. And yet again, we go to the word of God and that, that counteracts it in terms of our identity. We are a son a daughter of the Most High God, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You know, yeah. there's so many other ways for us to frame our identity. So, yes, I think naming it distances us up, distance ourselves and helps us to be able to do exactly yeah. that um, verse that we talked about in the beginning in, one, in 2 Corinthians 10, take that thought captive um, yeah. and, and, yeah, expose it for what it is. Yeah, that, that's such a helpful perspective. What, when you talk about wholeness, what do you feel like are the greatest enemies of that in our culture today? What is, what is the enemy using to wage war on the wholeness that God intended us to experience? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think um, our mind, is, I feel convinced and like, I feel passionate, convinced, convicted about um, the war that's going on in our mind. Um and so I think some of that is natural stuff that the supernatural gets on the back of. Um, so naturally speaking, we receive more information in a t or at least we have access to more information in a 24 hour period than someone living 100 years ago had access to in their entire lifetime. Mm. So that was like some recent studies that came up. So, I mean, just from a natural point of view, that's going to really impact your mind because look at the brain over 100 years. It's, it's not changed. And yet the amount of information that's coming towards it, the amount of blue light, um, all of the artificial stuff that we can get through our eyes um, into our minds and then into our hearts um, is definitely something that is a natural thing, but it's more than natural. It's something the enemy that can, that can use. And I think the enemy's always used our mind. He's always mm -hmm. tried to get into our mind, get us to question our identity, um, get us to doubt. So, you know, there's a great, um, loads of great study and research around mindfulness. And I know Christians sometimes get a bit uppity about that <laughs> phrase, but I think, well, let's, not allow secular society and um, new age to co-opt what was God's idea in the first place. Not Let's not allow them to co-opt it, twist it, pervert it. Whereas actually being mindful, go into Psalm 46 verse 10, be still and know. That's the whole premise of mindfulness about being still and know. And actually I think we're invited and instructed by God to be a people who are still and who internally and, and know that he's God. And yet we are less still than ever before, more questioning than ever before. And I think questioning is fine. Curiosity is fine. But, you know, questioning, deconstructing, pulling apart, refuting scripture. Um, we're going against the grain there. We're not being still and no. We're being incredibly overactive and we're questioning uh, beyond what's beyond helpful curiosity. And I just think the enemy gets on the back of all that stuff. He loves to get into our minds. We see it right in Genesis all the way to Revelation. You know, you, you just mentioned the power of mindfulness. And I've seen you post about, you know, meditation and, and gratitude and a lot of those other just methods that we can boost our mood and we can, you know, help counteract some of these attacks of the enemy. My life was transformed, I would say three and a half years ago when I finally took ownership for my spiritual rhythms and disciplines, and I started to embrace a lot of contemplative spiritual practices like silence, solitude, mindfulness, and meditating on scripture. And 
it completely transforms my heart and my life. And I saw something that you posted recently about, let me see if I, I wrote it down. Thank God for alpha brainwaves. And it made so much sense to me because it's a lot of the things that I was experiencing with fixed prayer throughout the day, like both in the morning and in the evening, and to see how God uses that to help frame the rest of your day. Can you walk through some of that? Because I thought it was really fascinating. Yeah, it's so interesting, isn't it? And I love the fact that it's it's called Alpha Brainwaves. I think um, that's so wonderful because it's um, pretty much a secular title for what God has ordained in our mind. But I love the way God's got his name in there somewhere, you know, Alpha, <laughs> the Alpha. Um, but yeah, so again, this is the state that um, maybe somebody who's into hypnotism, which is not something that I use in my practice at all, but um, they, they capitalize on these alpha brainwaves because when we're in an alpha brainwave state, it's a very relaxed state of our brain. Now we're able to really quantify this stuff now because we can measure it through, um, you know, brain imaging, brain scanning, connecting machines to your brain. Um and it's so what happens is that as you fall asleep at night time, you know, when you're in that kind of space between sleep and wakefulness. And also when you're in that space in the morning, that is if you haven't got kids that come in and like <laughs> wrestle you awake, you, you don't yes. get much opportunity to capitalize on that time. But um, particularly when you're going to sleep or waking up in the morning, you're in a relaxed state. And what happens there is um, it's almost like the door to your subconscious is slightly um, ajar. So essentially, you can get um, affirmations, truth. Your brain is more receptive to what you tell it. So if we can kind of use a biblical biohack, for want of a better word, that we um, a better phrase, we um, capitalize on, on that by meditating on scripture, as we read in Psalm 1. Um, first thing in the morning, last thing at night. It really goes, the way I put it um, therapy, um, theologically is it kind of goes past our soul, past our mind, will, and emotions, and right into our spirit, right into our inner person, um, the kind of most, the truest part of who we are. And it really begins to influence us. So, I mean, again, secular society would say, get up in the morning and speak some positive affirmations to yourself. And that works, but only because they're hijacking what God's already created, is that we're very receptive. And that's why I think, well, Let's focus on the word of God. This is the day the Lord has made. Let's yeah. rejoice and be glad in it. Or um, as we're falling to sleep, begin to speak the promises of God over yourself. And they really begin to get into your brain and into your thinking. Just a quick note, though, something that knocks you out of brain um, alpha brain wave instantly is blue light. So mm. um, it may be not the best thing to get your phone and do your devotion on your phone first thing in the morning or scroll for a Bible verse on the phone because that blue light will take you out of alpha, out of that receptive state, and you can't capitalize on it then. So paper Bible, journal and pen <laughs> all the way. <laughs> um, no, that, that's really good to know. I have found it so helpful for me in the mornings, and I'm not perfect at this, but I try most mornings to not look at my phone for the first hour and a half or so of the day. I say that, what I really mean by that is not getting on social media. So I'll still look at my phone for the yeah. time or to set like some music. So you're saying I shouldn't even touch it at all for like the first part of the morning. It's helpful not to. And actually, um, I write for an app called Glorify. And we um, we did some training. I did some training with the team where we talked about this. And so then they went to HR and said, we need Glorify alarm clocks because we don't we want to be capitalizing on this brainwave. We don't want to be using our phone as um as to be able to tell the time, can you get us alarm clocks? And they did. So we've got all these lovely, like branded um, Glorify alarm clocks. I'm not sure if they've got them yet, actually, but they're in they're in the process. Oh, that's cool. And um, yeah, it's, it's just quite a nice thing, isn't it? A nice gesture to be able to say, yes, we want you to be healthy and well. Let's capitalize on those brain waves. And it's it's easy to think that the, the, the those brain waves and the discovery of those brain waves belong in a complicated science lab. They don't. They're God's idea. You know, he's knitted mm. them into us. Some people get nervous and think, oh, that's crossing over slightly into maybe slightly new age to scientific stuff. And I think, well, who created our brain? Psalm 139. We see yeah. very clearly that God knitted us together. We're covered in, our, in his fingerprints. So I just feel increasingly passionate about claiming back for God what is his genius and mm. utilizing it so we can live in the fullness that he's called us to. Yeah, I, I totally agree. 
Is there any science that would be really interesting for us to know behind gratitude practices and what um, that unlocks within us? Yeah, absolutely. Gratitude is huge. And if I ha- if I could do you a service with a decent American accent, I would tell you that gratitude shapes your attitude in a brilliant accent, but I won't. I'll just stick with my English <laughs> one and say it in English. But gratitude does really shape your attitude. And actually, again, research fairly recently, um, as in within the last good couple of decades or so um that actually when we lean into gratitude and being grateful um it reduces our anxiety significantly essentially your brain can't really be anxious and grateful at the same time um so it's really worth doing a little bit of reading or even googling a bit more about that because it's fascinating and again you know secular society could say wow look at look at all the science community look at what we've discovered or look at um Uh, look at this truth that we found. And I think, well, no, Philippians 4 verse 6 tell us very clearly, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything through prayer, supplication and thanksgiving, or some paraphrases or translations would read gratitude, make your request known to God and the peace that surpasses all understanding will guard your mind and heart in Christ Jesus. And so I think God's always made that link for us between Mm. reducing anxiety um, through the practice of gratitude. And often when we look at how often scripture tells us to be grateful, it can almost feel a bit like God doesn't understand us or he's asking us just to sweep it under the carpet. And is he just being a bit unkind saying, oh, come on, buck up your ideas, just get great, just be grateful. But instead, the reframe I'd get it, I'd give it is that God knows that when we're grateful, not only do we get, um, not only do we reduce our anxiety, we get a boost of serotonin, like that feel-good hormone, uh, where we feel good. We get even get some dopamine, which is a reward hormone. And um, that when we get um, that reward dopamine hit, we want to do it again and again. So the more grateful we are, the more our, we can wire our brain towards gratitude. Um, And essentially, we are doing that, wiring our brain away from anxiety and towards gratitude. Mm. So gratitude is an incredibly um, important practice. And I love that phrase that you use in your book of the pivot, like the pivot, the practice, Mm -hmm. Um, because we do have to practice these things because we're good at them and then something knocks us off track or um, we, we do it for three days if you're anything like me and then we forget. So we're just practicing it again and again, but you will see the benefit of it. Um, in every sphere of your being. This is a question that I'll ask as a retired worship leader. Is there anything about singing in worship? Because I I think worship or or music is one of those ways that helps a lot of people feel connected to God. It unlocks our emotions. I know worship is much more than singing, but I do think, like you said, there's, there's God designed music. He designed our minds and our, our bodies to connect to music emotionally. Is there anything about that that helps our wholeness? Oh, that is, and it's so beautiful. And really we can conclude that we are created to worship. And it's so wonderful about the character of God as well, because it's not like he's sat on a throne as some kind of egomaniac saying, come on, worship me as we would and as we um, would think in an earthly sense, that actually even through our worship of him, there's still benefit for us. Not that we do it for that reason, but that God's kind of knitted and wired that into the whole process. It's just it's just so lacking in ego and so kind and gracious of him. But in terms of our bodies, yeah, absolutely. So um, there's, there's two things. One, when you repeat um, refrains, um, what the world, you know, new age might call a mantra, um, but we like a, a truth, a biblical truth, you repeat that thing again and again, it becomes wired deeper into your brain because you have the ability, because your brain's neuroplastic, you have the ability to wire your brain. And therefore, the more you declare something, the more you focus on it, the, the more your brain takes that as a truth. And actually, we then get into the idea of confirmation bias because um, your brain is always looking for evidence of what you've already told it to be true. So if you're Mm. telling your brain, God is faithful, God is good, God is kind, he's on my side, who who do I need to fear? That becomes part of your inner thinking. And then your brain looks for evidence for that to be true. So it really helps the way we see. But also physically, it helps stimulate what is called the vagus nerve. And again, if you, all you have to do is look through TikTok and Instagram for a couple of minutes and you'll see something on the power of the vagus nerve. But I think, well, hold on a minute. God created this nerve. 
God created the vagus nerve, so let's let's find out why. What does it do? So the vagus nerve is our 10th cranial nerve. It kind of goes here from the back of the neck all the way into the gut. And then we pass information on this kind of gut-brain axis between our gut and our brain, which is why often when we're feeling stressed or overwhelmed, we feel it in our gut. We feel sick or we can't eat, whatever that might be. Anyway, when we sing, um, the vibrations lead to an activation of the vagus nerve, the vagal nerve. And when the vagal nerve is activated, um, we become grounded. We can become very much in survive, um, thriving mode rather than survival mode, which increases um, increases empathy, compassion, decreases stress, anxiety. So, yeah, it, this vagal nerve activation is so powerful that actually singing when we feel stressed, depressed, overwhelmed, um, really is a matter of um, if we can make that choice with our soul, and David talks about worshipping with his soul, you know, um, overcoming how we might feel to worship, so overcoming our mind, our will, our emotions, we might not feel like it, but we become a huge beneficiary of it by the grace of God. So, yeah, activating that vagus nerve. There's some other things you can do. Maybe feel slightly less biblical, but, you know, um, holding cold ice, cold water immersion, gargling is another one. They all help to stimulate this vagus hmm. nerve, which can really help us feel well in our body, soul, and spirit. So, I mean, we've talked a lot about God designing us for wholeness and the methods that we can, what we can practice on a regular basis to help commune with God, to help take our thoughts captive, what do we do though? Because we look around the world and we see a lot of situations where wholeness is not evident. And we were recording this less than a week since the terrorist attacks in Israel. And it's such a horrific situation that we see unfolding. And I feel like, you know, we are constantly taking in things that are just devastating in our world. So how do you advise people to feel what we need to feel as humans, as Christians, as we grieve, as we lament, as we pray, as we act to try to make things better? How do we process that, but also still try to steward our hearts to yeah. keep our hearts at peace and at rest it feels like two very conflicting things. I know there's not an easy answer to it either, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Yeah, I'm really kind of working this out um, and, and walking this out as we all are. And just last night, actually, I was kind of, I was sat and I was scrolling through some of the headlines and one of my kids crawled into bed with me. And um, I was thinking, how come I get to sit here in my warm bed with this healthy, happy child kind of fast asleep next to me. And I'm now looking at this stuff on the news, which is so far removed from that. What is that? And how is that? And it's this huge, painful injustice, like mm -hmm. ramifications of living in a broken, broken world. Um, so there's a few things I think. In fact, I wrote a prayer about it because that's how I kind of process this, like, God, help me. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I was asking God of is like, help me to turn the other cheek, but not turn a blind eye. Like, help mm -hmm. me to follow that Jesus truth of like being instructed and invited to be someone who turns the other cheek. But don't let that be a blind eye to what might be going on. But then we hold that in the tension with not wanting to look away and just kind of carry on with our sphere with also then knowing, yes, we don't want to look away, but also kind of scrolling through the clickbaity media news can really rob peace. Hmm. Um, so let's look, look at it from a brain point of view. Going back to that, your brain can receive more information in one day than it could, you know, in a, a lifetime 100 years ago. I really believe our brain is not designed to know what's going on across the whole globe 24-7. I just don't think we're designed that way. Um, however, that we do have access to that stuff. And maybe 
I, I don't know. And I'm, I'm, I'm kind of working my way through this. Like I said, I'm figuring it out constantly for myself. But I think in terms of managing our own mind, there's a difference between rumination and meditation. Like rumination is going round and round in circles. It feels hopeless. It's difficult. It's, um, it doesn't move us. It doesn't move us forward. It doesn't bring us peace. Whereas meditation is different. When we meditate, meditate on scripture, on his goodness, it even kind of grows gray matter, or maybe it's white matter, I'm not sure. It grows some kind of matter in our brain. So I think when we're looking at this stuff, getting caught in rumination is not going to help anyone. Mm. Meditating on scripture and knowing the power of prayer, not only is, um, is that helpful on a wider basis because we know that prayer impacts our brothers and sisters across the globe. Um, so meditating on scripture and praying impacts them, helps change situations, helps change the narrative, spiritually, binding, loosing, all that kind of stuff. But it also does something in our own mind as well. So I think I would be careful of like falling down a road of, med- of rumination and instead mm. harnessing the God-given power of meditation. But also, again, we read in Lamentations, don't we, that like complete desperation, bitterness, gall, all of that awful stuff can weirdly live alongside hope. It's this very Mm. strange kingdom thing that um, the writer of Lamentations says, and therefore I have hope because this Mm. is who God is and this is what he's doing. But again, that doesn't help, does it? I mean, it helps in terms of when we zoom out or something, but zooming into the situation very traumatic very terrible to watch and even more terrible to be in so meditate over ruminate if i was going to give you a principle there to managing your mind amongst it all well i really appreciate how practical that is um and you're not giving a quick fix because there's no easy answer to what we're talking about but it is a principle that we can try to live by of i need to meditate on the injustice in our world and what I'm called to do about it as a Christian. I need to meditate on God's goodness in the face of such injustice. And what are, what is he asking the church to do? Um, How can I still trust God in the midst of all this fear? But at the same time, 24 seven looking at it on Instagram or on the news is not helpful. I think we need to each of us, you know, have to be in charge of our own minds, our own hearts, and we know what we can and can't take from it in terms of what's healthy for us. But I found it helps me to have like certain times where I choose to take in this information and say, okay, I, I want to be informed, but I don't need it all the time throughout the day as a practice. Maybe sometimes there's something going on where I need to be more updated. But I think that's what, as you're talking about meditation versus rumination, I think we can all take ownership for how to be responsible Christians, responsible citizens, responsible people, and be in charge of how we go and acquire information rather than always being bombarded with information when our brain can't handle it, if that makes sense. Absolutely. It it makes perfect sense. And um, I think this is, again, a, a very kind of physical analogy, but when we ingest too much of something, it inevitably does give us indigestion. It it shows up somewhere in our body, and um and and that that, that isn't helpful helpful for anyone. And yet it's difficult and so nuanced, isn't it? Because we have the privilege to say, yeah, oh well, I'm not going to watch that. Some people are living it, which just makes it so difficult. They don't have the choice. But again, I think in that privilege, noting the privilege of our postcode or zip code, if you're in America, kind of noting that privilege and not berating ourselves for it, but being grateful for it of like, okay, I recognize I have this huge privilege um, that comes with Mm -hmm. where I live or my life circumstances, what's been afforded to me. And sometimes we get caught up in calling that blessing, which becomes very problematic because why would we be more blessed than other people? So I I don't know, that's a whole nother kind of thing. But I think sometimes we say blessed when we mean privileged, really. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because even the other day I was, I felt like I was going simultaneously from praying and and thinking about what was going on in Israel, in Gaza, and talking to my f- kids about it. And then an hour later, I'm trying to launch this new part of my ministry and business. And then I felt like I had whiplash. And I'm like, oh gosh. I, yeah. And I felt guilty that I'm 
doing something like that when people across the world are dying. Yeah. And what do you do with that? Because I want to mourn, I want to grieve, I want to help. And then I want to steward what God's given me to steward here. And I think you, you helping give some language of privilege versus blessing. And we have to continue doing, what's helping me is I have to continue to impact and help the people that God has placed me around and the sphere yeah. that I'm in and that I can be a light for Christ in. And so how can I make the most of that each day while not ignoring what's going on in the world and the people who are suffering and doing what you said, like pray, give, mobilize, awareness. So yeah, it's, it's a whole bunch of messy emotions and feelings, but I think it's good sure. that you, that we talk about it because I think a lot of people are in that place and they don't know how to handle something like that. Yeah, absolutely. It's huge, isn't it? It's huge. And you were talking about lamentations and the, just the role of, sometimes all you can do, you're in a situation that is horrific and you can't get out of it. It is your 24 seven life. Yeah. And I think that that all throughout scripture, we see that God is, God is in that grief with us that yeah. um, God is in the moments where you feel like you have zero faith, you have zero answers. Even I was reading a Psalm the other day, I can't remember which one it is off the top of my head, but it was a pretty depressing Psalm. And I was waiting for the verse at the end that says, but my hope is in God. And that verse was not in the Psalm. Sure. The whole yeah. Psalm was just, where are you God? And as I was processing that and, and thinking about it afterwards, I was like, well, the hope in that Psalm is that the Psalmist was still bringing those feelings to God. It wasn't that there was an answer. It wasn't that he had a cliche, but at least he was crying out to God. And that was where the hope was. It wasn't stated, but it was implicit in who he was calling out to. And I think that's, that's what I'm leaning on right now. And that's what I think. And when my kid, like you and I've talked when my kids were in the hospital, that's all I knew to lean on. And I think that's part of going back, bringing this full circle with our emotions. When we don't deny our emotions, but we bring them to God, that's faith. It's it's calling out to yeah. the one, only one that can help us. Yeah, that's so beautiful. That that's exactly it. The problem becomes, isn't it? Yeah, when when we don't even process that stuff with God, we become cynical or, um, yeah just not involved not interested and so yes that's why i think anything that's brought to god an uncensored unedited heart and it, it like you said is faith it's faith isn't it trusting that he's there that he's listening that he's good that he's kind that he's for yeah. us and even just knowing those truths again um to help us find health and wholeness and healing because we're grounded on the truth that we're safe and loved within God's presence. I think that's a beautiful note to kind of land the plane on. I would ask, is there anything that is just on your heart to share that you haven't had a chance to, or you're like, oh, if I could just leave the listeners with this one truth, this would be it? I, I, for me, it's always hope that it doesn't matter or you might be listening and you feel like none of this can work for you, that it's too far gone, that you're too far down the track. But I would say, again, it's that lamentations. Therefore, I have hope. There's always hope. Um, there's new mercies, new mornings. And again, even that manifests in our brain because every time you wake up in the morning, you do have a new set hmm. of um, kind of synapses. You have a new, it's new, called neurogenesis, in fact. You, new things are born and birth, enable for you to, um, think different thoughts, meditate on different things. So there's the process of being made new and being made whole is knitted into your DNA. The mm. grace of God is knitted into your um, neurobiology through neuroplasticity that you don't have to stay where you are and that there's always so much hope for you. It's utterly biblical, this mm. principle of hope. and But also not only that, but we see it outworked in our physical bodies and how God's created our brain. So I just always finish. I'd always start and finish by saying, there is so much hope yeah. for you. That, that's amazing. I love that. I love your heart for people to experience that hope in Christ 
in their mind to experience that wholeness. Where can people follow you if they want to continue to learn more about this? Sure. So I post under the Faith Build therapist um so if you search joe hargreaves or the faithful therapist i should come up on instagram i really don't do facebook or tiktok <laughs> or twitter i'm mostly just over on instagram um, but i also have got a website as well which is joe hargreaves therapy.com where you can get a load of resources including webinars pdfs things that can help you um with overwhelm regulating your nervous system managing your mind god's way and then i have written just written an ebook called managing your mind god's way awesome i'll link to all of that in the show notes joe this has been a joy to have you on the show thank you so much thank you i've loved it thank you so much for having me love chatting with you there is so much in that conversation with Joe that would be helpful to put into practice from how you start your day to gratitude, to focusing on God's word. So I wanna encourage you to choose one practical step that you can take away. And then after you've done that for a season, then implement another, but don't get so trapped thinking about doing everything that you don't do anything. So I'll link to all of Joe's resources in the show notes and the YouTube description, as well as the list of scriptures uh, that I put together to help you overcome fear and anxiety. Don't forget, you can also support the show by liking, subscribing, and sharing the episode that helps us out tremendously because I wanna continue to give you more and more content just like this. I'll see you back here next week for more Dreamers and Disciples. Mm -hmm.